Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. It's a design series. We are actually in uh, series three. This is our third webinar of a three-part series. I'm Susan Ryan. I'm the Senior Director for the Greenhouse Project, and I am so appreciative of our sponsor, Perkins Eastman, for their ability to just step up and step into what really is something that is of such incredible significance to all of us during COVID times. What role does the physical environment really have to play in really ensuring that safety and well-being for elders? Um, what makes it so exciting is the way that it really intersects with our core values and the comprehensiveness of the model. I think um, some slides here about Perkins Eastman to let you know a little bit about who they are. So uh, they truly are an incredible group and a group that we so enjoy working with. Um, on the next slide, we'll kind of take a look at our core values, which really speaks to the comprehensiveness of our model. You will see real home there and the reality that real home is that physical environment. Real home is that space that we all call home and find most meaningful to us. But it really is just one leg of a three leg stool meaningful life, the philosophical culture that moves in and empowered staff, kind of what, um, you know, it's the human architecture, if you will, that really makes uh, the greenhouse model so much of what it is. So I am really uh, delighted to introduce two from Perkins Eastman. The first, Lee Pellegrino. Um, this is our, our panel for today, but Lee, I've gotten to know over the years and have really enjoyed working with Lee on some really, really big projects and uh, some others that we just get our heads together and, and figure out what are, how do we distill it down. But Lee is a co-managing principal of Perkins Eastman in their Pittsburgh studio. He's a leader in the firm's senior living practice. He has more than 20 years of experience in the planning and design of renovation and new construction projects of varied sizes for clients across the country. He is focused on deinstitutionalizing environments across the continuum of senior care with groundbreaking models that adhere to each state's regulations. And Lee, you and I both know that's not easy, especially with some of the work we did in New York. Lee possesses the particular expertise and passion for leading culture change strategies, connecting current trends with client expectations and overall design vision. So Lee, welcome. Thank you, Susan. Um, Another uh, person from Perkins Eastman, an architect, Aileen Funara, is an architect with more than 25 years of experience on a variety of project types. She's currently involved in, uh, with Perkins Eastman work in the design of residential and care environments for seniors. A seasoned professional, Aileen's responsibilities include project design and coordination, beginning with project spatial and budgetary requirements and pre-schematic design, through construction documentation and construction observation. Her oversight provides continuity in design, quality, documentation, technical execution, and process. And I can tell you later on today, I will join um, your colleague, Alexis, in Leading Age California for a presentation. So Perkins Eastman, we are always delighted to work with you and really uh, grateful once again for your participation. And I just want to thank Heather and Jessica, who will be joining us. You'll see them later on as our presentation goes forward. As I always say, they are the two that are living the dream. And they are, uh, Heather's the director of nursing at Willow Ridge, and Jessica is a Shabazz there. So they know up close and personal the value of the physical design. And my colleague, Debbie, will be joining uh, me later on to, for some Q&A. So if you've got questions, make sure you put them in the Q&A box. So I'm going to get out of the way and I'm going to turn it over to Lee and Aileen. Thanks so much, guys. Thank you, Susan. Now, thank you for the introduction and really thank you for the, the opportunity to, to partner with you on this design series. This has really been a, a great experience and you know the stories we continue to hear continue to inspire us. As, as Susan indicated, this is part three of a three-part series. Four weeks ago, we talked about greenhouse at the scale of community, uh, the, the different configurations that greenhouses can come together on a, on a site, and all the opportunities, what happens outside the walls of a greenhouse. 
you know, two weeks ago, we talked about greenhouse at the scale of, of the house, uh, the spaces that are shared between the elders and the Shabazim, and what really ma what makes house home. And today we're going to be talking about greenhouse at the scale of a private room you know, and, and really focus on dignity, privacy, and choice. We'll be looking at the entry, the bathroom, and the bedroom, as well as some of the uh, some of the insights from the past 15 months. Uh, and we will be taking pauses at each of these breaks. Uh, so as, as Susan indicated, please do share your questions in the question and answer. And we'll take breaks at the end of each of those to, to, to talk about those. Uh, but we wanted to take a moment to recognize the greenhouse homes that were part of this process. Uh, we, we interviewed 10 different greenhouses, uh, administrators, guides, nurses, directors of nursing, and Shabazim, uh, who really shared some really great stories and some really wonderful insights. And today we have the opportunity to invite uh, the, uh, Heather and Jessica from Willow Ridge uh, to share some of those stories directly with you and get those insights and, and that inspiration. Welcome, guys. So when we talk about a private room, when we talk about a resident room, that means a lot of different things to different people, uh, from long-term care to post-acute uh, memory care. And so what we want to do is, what does a resident room mean to greenhouse? And there's a couple really important key features. Uh, first, the rooms are all private. It's really hard to promote dignity, privacy, and choice when you're separated by a curtain or share a bathroom. Uh, the, the next thing is that the orientation of the bathroom itself is such that uh, there are visual cues as well as a physical proximity from the bed to that bathroom, really important. Uh, all rooms have ceiling lifts and all rooms have med cabinets uh, so that the medicines are stored for that individual elder in their room and they're given to them in the, in the room. We're going to talk a little bit more about how important that really is. But as you can see, beyond those couple things, there are three lenses which all the other decisions uh, to make a greenhouse really uh, feature. First are the core values that Susan discussed. Second is the mantra, would you do that in your own home? <laughs> and the third is really trying to uh, grasp the culture, the priorities, the personality of each individual greenhouse home adopter so that they can make their house, uh, their greenhouse, you know, their greenhouse. Uh, and as you can see on the screen, there are three very different greenhouse uh, private rooms, uh, but all greenhouses all reflect different cultures, personalities uh, that uh, really feature into how those are developed and designed. So let's start with the entry room. So the entry is the, is the threshold into the most private, most personal aspect of, of the greenhouse. It's the resident, residence room, the elders room. Uh, it's a window into their personality and their identity. It's also a window into their day. And to be able to choose whether that door is open or closed is a choice to share that with their fellow uh, elders in the Shabazim or a choice to create some moments of privacy. Next, Aileen's going to be talking about some of the features of the entry. Uh, Aileen, you're on mute. Sorry, classic. Uh, as Lee said, there are choices and priorities to help guide what is right for your house in defining this entry piece to your home. Uh, the door itself uh, can vary in size and configuration. Um, there on the left, you can see there's a, a single door, a larger single door on the, on the very right is a double door with a bigger leaf and a smaller leaf. Um, and each of these choices have different advantages and disadvantages. Um, the door itself is also a place where you can per personalize your door. You can see the, the lovely wreath on, on the left there. Um, the space just inside the door, which you, you, know, you can see kind of here on the, on the middle or something you see just beyond that, and on, also on the right is uh, what we'll, we'll call the vestibule. Um, it's a place where you can hang your coat and you can kind of see Hinting uh, on the right, very right hand picture, there's a coat and a, a blanket on that little shelf. Um, you can hang your hat or even keep your gardening shoes and other things that you would keep by your own front door in your home. Um, in COVID times, it's a really great flexible space um, that could be used uh, to hang PPE, for example. Um, the entry really offers this view into, your, into the bedroom 
and where you really start to get a taste of that person's real home. Uh, maybe you catch a glimpse of a special chair like you see here in the middle or some artwork or some plants or uh, other decoration that's particular to that person. So empowered staff. For, for staff, this vestibule space um, is a really useful work, workspace as well. Um, they can store what they need here in order to administer medications bedside rather than by carts like, like you might do in a more traditional nursing home. Um, here's examples of different size medicine cabinets. Um, the smaller one on the left has a, a flip down door kind of workspace. The one in the medium, just uh, middle is just kind of a medium version of that. And the one on the right is a little bit bigger version. You can see there's a countertop, a place to put a laptop, and um, even a little bit of a light and a place to really prepare meds. Um, it's also a really convenient place to store supplies that are tailored to that elder's needs. So on the right, you can see a little more space cabinetry for, for that kind of storage. Um, I also just want to point out on the right hand, the larger cabinet to the right of the, uh, the med space is the, the wardrobe for that room. And on the two photos on the left, you see the, the closet for storage for that person's room. Um, so decentralizing meds is, is really, it really helps the nurse do their job more effectively. And having these care supplies convenient and handy um, helps the Shabazim do their work more efficiently. Uh, Heather and Jessica, if, wouldn't you, if you would, would, could you tell us what this looks like at Willow Ridge? Sure. So um, at Willow Ridge, we are actually the picture in the middle there and the bottom cabinet flips down and it's a workspace and then the top cabinet opens um, where the medications are. And it really gets the nurse out from behind uh, the med cart and actually in with the elder, which we really like. Um, when we're preparing medications, we're able to kind of watch the elder. We can see them when they're transferring. We know how they're doing. We can talk with them. Um, we're, we're in their home at that point and we're just offering a service. Um, so the nurses here really have enjoyed having the meds in the rooms. Not only, I mean, it cuts down on any kind of med errors because you don't have to worry about giving somebody the wrong meds. They're, you're right there in the room with that elder. So we love it. You know, so, so as you heard from, from Heather, you know, there's the practical aspect of, of meds in the room from reducing errors to really to, to being able to dispense the, that medication when it's most appropriate for that elder as opposed to at mealtime just because it's most convenient. There's also a human aspect of, of doing the meds in the rooms and it's the opportunity to create, to create and build those relationships between the elder and the Shabazim. Uh, you know, as, as, they, as that relationship builds, that Shabzim has the ability to recognize subtle changes. It's, it's a term that Greenhouse uses as deep knowing. You know, when, when there are changes in their mental or physical health, they're able to recognize that just as you would a, a close friend and be, able, and be empowered to, to do what is necessary to create some of that, uh, to create uh, change, to be able to provide the, the right appropriate care for, for that elder. Debbie, any questions so far? Yes, we've got some questions. So um, Heather, I think this would probably go to you. Um, and it's, there's, there's two questions here. One, do you keep the MAR uh, medication administration record in with the medications? That's one question. And how does the medication cabinet work if the elder chooses to spend most of their day outside of their room? Okay, so we actually use, um, uh, electronic medication administration record system. So the nurse has a laptop that we had, um, basically it's a podium on wheels. Uh, somebody in the community actually handmade them for us out of wood that matches the look of the house. And the nurse takes that um, computer from room to room. So that's how we access the electronic uh, MARS. And then let's see, what was the other question? Oh, what? outside of their room, okay. Um, so we will still just go to their room to retrieve the medications and then we go find them. Sometimes they're out on the front porch, sometimes they're on the back patio, um, sometimes they're in the hearth, sometimes they're in the den watching a movie with some other elders, um, or they may be at the, at the dining room table if that's where they prefer their meds. 
um, we can do it there, but um, it just gives us the opportunity to catch them either right before or right after they go out to a meal. Okay. Um, so this is probably a, com a question for the architects. What's the typical bedroom square footage? Is there a typical bedroom square footage? <laughs> Good question. Um, depends on who you talk to. <laughs> uh, I think what's interesting on, on the early slide, and you'll get a, a PowerPoint at the end, uh, I think we'll email tomorrow, uh, you'll get that first slide that showed those couple three, uh, three rooms. Uh, and they represent a pretty wide range, you know, from a 225 square feet to 260 square feet. You know, the goal is to be able to have enough space to maneuver, but not to have too much space that it makes it difficult for elders to make it from, from feature to feature to walk, use a piece of furniture to walk from the bed to the bathroom. All right. And Jessica, maybe you could help answer this one. Um, says, do you consider it appropriate for residents to have to invite friends or other residents into their bedroom? And how does that fit with the mantra? Um, they're more than welcome to invite friends into the room. I mean, we advocate for, you know, asking before they come in, obviously. Um, we have lots of ladies who share magazines or puzzle books or things like that, and they feel encouraged to go around and knock on a door just like you would your neighbor or somebody and say, you know, hello, I've, I'm, I'm just dropping this off for you quickly. And the person has the option to invite them in if they'd like. And if not, it can be a quick exchange and move on and they'll see them at supper or at the next event. So yeah, we, we enjoy that they can have, have, you know, it's just like home having friends over. So maybe you could um, comment on this. When you think about normalization, of uh, visitation in your home or my home, most of that visitation would happen somewhere else besides the bedroom. So in a greenhouse home, you have other spaces. Can you comment a bit on where that visitation would normally happen in the greenhouse home? Um, at our home, it can happen in the den. It could happen out at the hearth. They're, they could sit out on the back or the front porch. Um, we have little sitting areas along throughout the hallways sometimes if they want to sit and just visit outside their rooms. Um, you know, it's their home. They, they get free run of visitations wherever they feel fit. Okay, thank you. Um, the last, I think we have time for another one. The last one I probably is, um, maybe the architects could help uh, talk a little bit about this, but it says identification signs at the entry. Um, that's not something that you would see in your own home. And I know there are some states that have certain types of requirements. Um, what have you seen done to help um, provide that direction to the room or personalization at the entry? Well, you're right. We, we do try to re minimize the, the numbering, the signage, the names, and, and, and uh, the the. the the question is correct that different jurisdictions have certain requirements and usually it comes down to the fire department wanting to be able to recognize each number, um, each name, each room with a, with a number. You'll see uh, if you look back and actually let me flip real quick. You'll see here there's a tiny little four and it was just in, in this, this particular instance, that was all that was necessary for the jurisdiction to really uh, have what they needed while not being so disruptive as some of the other larger room numbers that other jurisdictions will require. That's a great, um, great example of our minds tend to think of certain types of institutional identification. Um, we still have a couple of minutes, so let me uh, pose this question to uh, Heather, it says, do you like to have meds come in a pill pack configuration in, in addition to using the med cabinet in the room? How do you guys go about that? So um, our cabinets were actually built for our seven day medication system that we get from our pharmacy. It's called Right Pack. Um, and then there's also space for any additional, you know, Mylanta, milk and magnesia bottles like that. Um, there's space for PRN medications. And the bottom of the cabinet, there is space for any kind of treatment supplies. So we, and we just keep all that separate. You know, we keep the eye drops away from the pills, away from the dressing supplies. And there are spots for that in the cabinet. Okay. I think that answers that. All right, thank you. And mm -hmm. for those of you in the audience, if you'll please place your questions in the Q&A box. Um, 
rather than the chat that would that would help us get to them faster. So I'm going to turn it back to uh, to Lee and Aileen. Thanks, Deb. So the next space is is the bathroom. If the private room is about privacy, the private bathroom is about dignity. Uh, and the, the the number of fixtures, the codes, the regulations are going to be very similar from from room to room. The the, the art in, the art is putting them all together uh, to allow what, what greenhouse refers to as habilitation or the or the ability to to encourage the elder to care for themselves as as best they can uh, do those things that they can to care for themselves um, not just encourage it but also give them the tools and the bathroom is that tool uh, Aileen's going to share some of the features so oh, as Lee said, you know, the, the bedroom is the, is the most private space and the bathroom is the most private space in the house. Uh, there's so many components that go into the bathroom and a lot of different ways to arrange them um, for such a small space. That's pretty surprising, but having done it so many different ways, I know. So, so how do you make it feel like real home? Um, first and foremost, the bathroom has to be functional for the elder. I mean, it has to work for them. It's their bathroom. They have to be comfortable, it has to be accessible, and it has to have elements of normalcy to make it feel right. like real home. Um, so what are some of these elements that make it feel normal and comfortable? Um, maybe having a hamper like you see there in the center photo, uh, a place for your hand towel, having a place to put your toothbrush that, that you're happy with, uh, a place for your personal items, uh, a sink, countertop, space to roll under. Maybe that's a place where you can do your own makeup. Um, good lighting and having your own shower with your own shower products in it. Um, it's equally important to remove as many institutional cues as possible in order to make it feel like real home. Uh, for example, a lot of stainless steel fixtures may feel institutional to some. Um, touchless faucets you don't usually see those in your home, so that might feel unfamiliar and maybe even be confusing to someone who has dementia. Um, finishes and interior design play a big part here in reflecting home. Um, every house can be different. Um, here on the right, on the top and the bottom, are two examples of the same bathroom. Um, they're really exactly the same, um, yet they have a really different character even though they're part of the same community. So that's an example of, you know, different choices and different personalities really can be reflected. So in the bathroom, I just wanna to touch on a few of the components um, that are key in helping empower the staff, especially when they're designed and composed carefully and thoughtfully. Um, one of these that I wanna talk about is the overhead lift system. Um, a lift that goes from the bed to the toilet increases the ability of the elder to use the toilet. Um, we heard from some of our greenhouse interviews that it would be really helpful for the lift to also go to the shower. In some cases it does, and sometimes it doesn't. Um, if it does, it would save a transfer and cause less stress on the body. Um, and it's also a lot easier for the Shabazz as there's a lot of heavy lifting. So it makes, it just makes it physically easier for them. Um, grab bars are another um, component, of course, that are needed. Um, the photo um, there on the top right is just your traditional grab bar on the back and sidewall. Uh, the one in the top middle is a photo showing drop down grab bars and um, Heather and Jessica will talk a little bit more about those in a sec. Um, we also asked the greenhouses, what, what are your storage needs in the bathroom? Um, the Shabazz needs to have care supplies that are within reach when they're assisting an elder in the bathroom. Um, what those supplies are will vary depending on the needs of that particular elder. Um, you'll see on the, on the top right, there's a little white cabinet next to the toilet. So that's an example. There are some care supplies. On the left-hand side, you see sort of a tall pantry cabinet um, that's uh, next to the shower and across from the toilet. And the bottom right is a smaller cabinet for, for care supplies and personal items. Uh, another component is the shower. Um, so, you know, there are a couple different types of showers, um, each with their own advantages and disadvantages. Again, it's all about choice and uh, priorities. So on the left and bottom center, you see a roll-in shower with the trench drain in different locations, 
top middle is an example of a European shower. Um, so Heather and Jessica, can you talk about the uh, value of some of these various features? Um, I would say the overhead lift is invaluable. It is the highlight of the bathroom, in my opinion. Um, it really extends the longevity of your Shabazz as well, because it, it takes a lot of the, the heavy lifting out of things. And it's a lot easier on the elder, so you're not, um, it just makes the transition so much nicer. Um, with grab bars, the fold down ones are nice because they can, different elders, different needs, you can fold them out of the way so you can get closer for personal care. Um, you know, depending on what they need, they can have both of them or just one. So that's always a, a great option. Um, and then having having the cabinet there for the care supplies is, is great. Um, you know, you don't want to step away from an elder because you run out of gloves or something that's just so basic that you need to finish up your care. It's right there. They're constantly stocked. We, we have everything that you need just right at, at your fingertips where, where you need it. We had some elders come from um, a traditional setting prior to moving to Willow Ridge, and they were so pleased that they could leave their own personal products in their shower. They no longer had to carry them in a caddy um, to the shower room. They had a shower in their room, so they loved that aspect. There is still um, a tub bath back at the in the in the spa room of the house, so that is more of a shared space. Um, but there is that still still that ability to take a a bath or even a, a whirlpool bath, but they really do like to have their own private showers in their rooms. Thank you. Thank you. So how does the bathroom contribute to that core value of meaningful life? Well, for, for most of us, you know, those first moments of the day set the tone for the day. Uh, same would be true for the elders. And, and for all of us, you know, the bathroom is part of that, that first, you know, that routine or early morning routine. You know, for some elders, it's about, as Aileen said, you know, having that sh those shower products that they've been using for years, that's common, that's normal, it's important to them. For some elders, it's the, the soft touch of the towel on their skin. And, and for some elders, it's, it's having the things that they can they care, use to care for themselves. Um, but it's not enough just to have a sink and a big counter to put those on. It's about having, having that counter and being able to sit there and, and have all the right dimensions and proportions so that elder can reach across, pick up the toothbrush and brush his teeth by himself. Or that the lighting is, is, is well, the space is well lit and the mirror is angled properly so that an elder can, prepare, can put her own makeup on. And those, those are the activities of, of habilitation that really contribute to dignity and contribute to the meaningful life. Uh, Debbie, questions on the bathroom? Yes, we do have a few. Um, so there's a question here that says, I like the drop down uh, bars by the toilet. What percentage of new bills use these versus the standard? Um, any comments there? Uh, I can't speak to percentage, but I can say that we do this very often now. Very rarely do we use the, the traditional one, and there's a couple of reasons for that. Um, one is by using the drop down grab bars, we can pull the toilet away from that side wall and create that space on either side of the toilet for the staff to be able to provide care on the side in which that elder needs. You know, for instance, if there's uh, needs because of a stroke, one side is definitely gonna be needed on the other. Or for uh, an, a, 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 an elder with weight to use uh, elder, um, or sorry, a Shabazim on either side, uh, both sides. Um, there was a question, is this, is this skilled nursing or is this assisted living? So just for the audience, this is skilled nursing. And the majority of uh, the homes are, are licensed as skilled, although there are some assisted living greenhouse homes. So Jessica and Heather, um, there's some questions about tubs. Uh, one is, do you ever use a walk-in tub? And is there a bathtub available in greenhouse homes? Um, sometimes elders benefit from a bathtub. What would you say about that? So um, we have two houses here at Willow Ridge and both houses um, have a spa room is what we call it. Um, it is where there is a, it's called, it's a Parker tub. We got ours through Arjo. Um, there's many, many different options out there. Um, ours is not a walk-in one, 
but you can walk up to it and sit so the door comes up. Um, you can also use the lift. There's a ceiling lift back in that spa room and we can use the lift to get elders in and out of that tub if need be. Um, and we use it, you know, it kind of varies. One house right now uses it quite a bit, probably five days a week. Um, the other house, not as much right now. It just depends on the elders. There's another question here about um, the bathrooms and it says, can, can you speak to how often the baths become full wet rooms um, requiring waterproofing on all walls or are they typically large roll-in shower areas and waterproofing systems contained to that area? So maybe first, um, Jessica, you could describe what your bathrooms are like at Willow Ridge and then maybe the architects could take the rest of that question. Um, so here at Willow Ridge, ours is what I would call kind of a traditional step-in shower. There's a, a form shower. You, we have a little bit of a lip at the bottom and um, we have kind of designed our own, what we call a, a shower skirt. It's a, a bungee that goes across the bottom and it has a um, shower curtain hanging from the bottom so that it's protecting the Shabazz from getting wet and it just hooks across and then we can get, you know, they have a bench in them. They can sit right down there or if someone needs a shower chair, you just, it's a little bump and you get them right in there. Um, but I know others have what they, the European shower that's just a smooth tile. Uh, yes, I think there, there's kind of two different types of, of showers, as, as uh, Jessica described, one that's a more preformed that sits in an alcove, and it has all the features that really keep the water within that alcove. Um, but there are other ways to do it, including an alcove where the floor is continuous, and so there's not a dam, there's not something to roll over, but there is that continuous uh, tile, and it's a placement of the drain that allows that to um, to drain and keep the rest of the room dry. Uh, there will be splatter. And so there is a bit of a backslope so that that splatter does get captured back into that drain. Uh, we waterproof the walls of that alcove and the floor, but nothing the rest of the room, the rest of the bathroom. And could you also comment on night lights? Um, where are night lights located? And um, you know, how does the elder trigger that coming on and going off? Uh, often the codes require a nightlight in the bathroom as well as in the vest in there somewhere in the room. So we try to place those as in the vestibule so they're not they're not glaring. They don't provide a lot of light to distract uh, residents from trying to, to sleep. Um, what we've also seen do in, in certain areas is we've incorporated into the nightstand or the dresser that's next to the bed some motion sensor. And sometimes it's also uh, as part of the bed itself, but there's a small light underneath there. So motion sensor with an elder steps out of bed, it triggers that motion sensor and turns on a low light that's pathway lighting to help illuminate to get to the room and be able to get to a switch. Okay, um, let's stay on the architectural side a little bit. Um, someone said they're wondering if they see a faucet that automatically emits water or does the elder have to turn the handle on? And I, I wonder Heather and, and uh, Jessica, what you would say about that? Um, from a Shabazz standpoint, we, we, we have the faucets that turn on with a handle and I think that's the best option. Some of our elders are in lower wheelchairs or maybe have a hard time keeping their hands, you know, in the sensor area. So it could be hard for them to properly get through washing them, their hands by themselves. So having the, the traditional style really is helpful and they can adjust it to whatever temperature they need rather than having to wait on it to warm up and, and hold it, their hands in the sensor. Okay. All right. Um, so now let's let's talk a little bit more about the ceiling lifts. Um, so when you're using lift, you're using a sling to have that elder go from bed into the bathroom. Um, is that a sling that you keep that they that it's like a net that they keep on when you take them to the shower? Do you transfer them to a shower chair? How does that work with the ceiling lift and transfers? We, um, we use a couple different style of lifts so, or of slings. Um, so it depends on the elder, um, their size, what's comfortable for them. But we usually find one or two that work for one elder and then they keep those slings in their room. 
Um, there are uh, mesh style and they're called shower slings that we do use if it's gonna stay under somebody while they're in the shower. Um, otherwise it's just the traditional one. And we always try to remove them. Once we get the elder situated in their chair, their wheelchair, their recliner, their bed, we, we try not to ever leave a lift sling under somebody. And they're, they're designed so that you can, you know, tuck and, and roll them and to each side and you can get it out pretty easily. Okay. That helps. Maybe also now comment on the um, perceptions around using a lift. Um, what are the benefits to the staff, but also what, what perceptions do elders and their families have about ceiling lifts? Some people might perceive that as a bit scary um, versus the normal uh, or the institutional approach to transfers, which is um, a, a Hoyer lift or something. So talk about the pros and cons of that. So when we tour um, new families here at Willow Ridge, um, I just had one recently, they walked into the room and we showed them the ceiling lift, knowing that their loved one didn't need it at this time, but the, it was very comforting to them to see that there. And that just meant to them that their elder did not have to move um, as they needed more care. They can stay in that same room and they can get the, mo the most care that they need. Um, we also have portable lifts, one in each house, just in case there is an incident out in the, the hearth area um, or any area that doesn't have the ceiling track in it. Uh, we do have those lifts, but the elders call them the big purple people movers because they're kind of big pieces of equipment. So they much prefer the ceiling lifts in the room that has a very small motor that goes room to room. Um, and it's just out of the way. You don't notice it at all. Um, so they definitely prefer those. I don't know if you have anything else about I, I think um, for elders who may be moving and who don't have the need currently when they move in, it just becomes part of their home. They, it's not scary because they, they know that it's an option and they've seen us, you know, seen what it can do and it's, it's safe. Um, and so living there, it's just part of their room. It blends right in. So if they do happen to get to a point where they need that, it doesn't seem out of the ordinary or scary, at least we've found. Um, so there's a, a question here about design recommendations in showers. Um, if you have a majority of elders that are living with dementia and may need assistance. So is there anything uh, different about the showers, uh, either in the pictures that we saw or your experience at Willow Ridge that you do differently if someone is living with dementia and needs more assistance? Um space. You, I mean, just, just like at your own home, there's never enough space. So I would say a little bit bigger, just in case it's somebody who maybe needs two Shabazz to help shower. Um, it gives you a little more room to situate an elder in a different way. Um, we've had some elders who, you know, could be slightly combative during showers. So maybe turning them a certain way calms them a little better. So just, just more space, I think would be helpful. Anything to add from either of our architects related to design and dementia? I think that there's a, a, um, a lot to consider and really talking to the Shabazim um, on how they do this process. I did this on a project and it really is, again, as many times as I've done this, I'm always learning. Um, even something as small, there's, there's new regulations now, the new ANSI requires the controls to be in a different place than we prefer and have preferred in the past. So if it's on the back wall, um, how do how does the Shabazim, or the Shabazz turn on the water without they themselves getting a bath? Um, as Heather mentioned, you know, there, there's a sort of a bungee shower curtain, which I think is brilliant, or, or maybe having an extra hook so that you can warm the water, put it down for a second, but not having it flopping around on the floor and the wall do shampoo, get, get the things, get that person comfortable and then grab it again. So it's just really small things. Um, and just thinking about all those little bits and pieces, I think really hate, help make that a comfortable experience. Well, it feels like we could probably have a, a, an hour long webinar just on the bathrooms. There's <laughs> no more questions coming in, but I wanna leave time. So let me turn it back to, um, to Lee and Aileen so we can um, continue to move through and we'll try to come back to questions. 
Thank you, Debbie. <clears throat> uh, and the, and the, the bedroom is that personal sanctuary for, for the elder. It's, it's where they surround themselves and all their things that you know, have memory, uh, that have meaning. Uh, and it's more than just having pictures or a favorite chair. Uh, the greenhouse really is focused on, really focused on uh, getting to know that individual elder, their personality, their identity, and really personalizing that room to really reflect that. Aileen's going to talk some more about those features. So the aspects of the bedroom that make it feel like real home are the things we enjoy most, you know, in our real homes. It's things like the windows, um, having them be operable, having natural light stream in, access to a pleasant view, um, a bird bath, uh, the spring flowers growing, good lighting that I can control, um, having enough space to place my belongings and have enough space in the room that's flexible enough for me to arrange the furniture uh, to my liking and, and even perhaps to bring in a few of my favorite pieces. Um, so I know Heather and Jessica have some wonderful stories. Uh, how, how do your families at Willow Ridge help personalize the bedroom? Um, so here at Willow Ridge, actually the picture to your left is one of our elders rooms. Um, she had come to us and her, her daughter said that she's had a piano everywhere she's ever lived. And where she was before that, they didn't have the piano room for it because it's more of a traditional style style of nursing center mm -hmm. and um they actually didn't even know she played the piano um we we got her moved in they had the piano here and ready for her and as soon as she got here she sat down and she played and she's i mean it's amazing she she was a music teacher so of course she plays a piano and you know her family was able to set it up with things that are familiar for her so walking in it you know, it was new, but these are her belongings. This is her space. She really felt empowered and at home. Thank you. And if I hadn't seen that photo, I wouldn't have believed it when you said that you could fit a piano in that room. So we wouldn't yeah. have either. <laughs> um, so empowered staff in the bedroom. So like I said, the size of the room has to be adequate for the staff to function and assist the elder, obviously. Um, you have to have enough space to maneuver around the bed, to get in and out of the bathroom, of course, is very important. Um, and this example on the bottom right, you can see on uh, that design, there's a window seat next to the bed, which is a great place uh, for the Shabbos to sit and talk with the elder and administer care make a relationship, build trust. Um, and the two examples you see on the, on the left and on the top right, uh, you see the, the bathroom door is actually a sliding barn door. Um, the value of the barn door is that it just saves so much space. Um, it helps keep the room smaller. And, and just a note on that, um, more space isn't necessarily a good thing. More space means more stuff and further dis distances to travel, um, like we mentioned earlier. Um, these projects also need to stay affordable, um, so bigger isn't necessarily better. Um, apparently big enough to hold a piano is important. <laughs> um, earlier, we also touched, uh, uh, you know, we talked about the lift, uh, just to point out, you know, sometimes you see in projects that are just in the bathroom or just in the bedroom. Um, here you can see on the, on the big picture here, um, the lift actually goes from the bedroom to the bathroom and is integral with the barn door. Um, track, which is a which is a great, uh, relatively new thing. Um, but one thing that we've learned from our interviews that that for greenhouse is especially helpful to have that bed to toilet view and and physical connection. Um, lifts uh, come in so many shapes and sizes and configurations and offer a lot of different coverage depending. Um, you know, so it really depends on the needs of, and the priorities of that house as to, you know, which you choose. Um, no matter what you choose, a list helps to accommodate aging in place. Um, Heather and Jessica, can you share, you know, maybe some stories about how the list, how you use a list, you've talked about it some, and, and what the family feel about them, you know, any, any other stories along that line? About lifts. So I think the biggest thing from the bedroom to the bathroom with the lift would be 
um, we have people that came from a different facility and were never able to use a toilet. And so here, because of the lift and the ease of that with staff, they're actually able to use the toilet versus like a bedpan or a commode even. Um, we don't use bedside commodes at all. We get everyone to the toilet. Um, it's, a, it's in close proximity to their bed. And then with the lift, if they're completely dependent, we can use the lift to get them there, which has been wonderful. Great, thank you. The, uh, the large image on the left is, is actually an image that Debbie shared with us. You know, it's one of her favorite that she shares to really illustrate the you know, vision of what a bedroom in a greenhouse home can really be. It's about, you know, the, the elder really taking ownership of that space and really making it there so they can really be themselves. You know, when we shared this image, uh, Heather, and, uh, Heather and Jessica said, oh, we have somebody like that too. Uh, <laughs> would you like to share a little bit about Kareem? Sure. Um, Kareen, so Kareen was able to move in with us and it was a, a planned move. We weren't in a crisis mode or anything like that. So the family was able to come in and bring, um, all her personal items. And she had this treasured picture of her four boys. They were able to bring that. They said that that goes with her everywhere. And it's always the center of her room. And so they have a little table in her room and that picture's right there on the center, but they were able to do that so that when, when Kareen, who has dementia, you know, walked into the room, she looked around and yes, it was a new environment, but all the things around her were familiar. She had her favorite chair there. She had her favorite little dining room table. Um, she had pictures on the walls of all of her family. So it really, it really looked like her home. There wasn't a question that, that, that was her, her space. So yeah. And she still enjoys it. And she, she does. She sits in a chair like that with her legs over the side, just like the picture. I think we have time for one more story from Willow Ridge. Um, what about pets? Um, we've actually had elders who, um, we had one, Glenn, who had his own cat, Lucy, who he, he preferred to keep her in his room. But I mean, we were able to accommodate that. Uh, it was a like a Persian cat, a very furry cat. <laughs> and, you know, he we equipped it so that everything that the cat needed was right there in the room and it was really meaningful to him because he'd had this cat you know since he had been home um you know it made coming here more wealthy he didn't want to get rid of his animal um and we were able to accommodate that and we're glad we we all enjoyed the cat quite a bit <laughs> great thank you uh, debbie questions uh so if a family member wants to spend the night, is that possible at a greenhouse and where would it happen? Um, we've had family members spend the night in the elder's room if they want to. Um, we also have a den, which is where Jessica and I are sitting right now. And behind us, there is a, a couch in each den that has a fold out bed um, that sometimes staff have used during snowstorms and other times families have used um, if they came in from out of town or if their loved one just wasn't doing very well and they wanted to stay close by, um, we've been able to do that too. The doors to the den have some blinds on them so that there's privacy for that um, family member that stays in here. Uh, there's a comment about handrails and there was also a comment about emergency pull cords. So um, do you have emergency pull cords in the bathrooms? They didn't see them. Maybe they just weren't in the picture. And what would you say about um, handrails? Are those present in the greenhouse home? Are they just in the bathrooms? Uh, yeah, we, we, in our bathrooms, we have a, a pull cord system. It's right to the, for our toilets, to the right of the toilet. Um, you know, our system is able to be adjusted if it's somebody who's maybe shorter or taller, they can get it so it's optimal height for them. And then in the, the bedroom area, we actually have like a call light system um, and they also have pendants. So if they're, if they decide they wanna go on the back porch, they have their pendant and it will tell us, you know, uh, room one back patio or, you know, where it gives a, a general area of where the person is, you know, if you're, weren't the person that put them there. And then, yeah, we have handrails throughout the building. It's sometimes hard to tell because they blend in so well. Mm -hmm. um, they, they match the aesthetic of the house, the, the wood trim, and you know, they line all of our hallways and there, there's a, quite a bit of grab rail actually. Okay. Um, 
they don't, uh, these pictures don't necessarily show any televisions in the bedroom. So do you have televisions in your bedrooms and what's your thinking on that? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's up to the elder. Some we've had elders who don't have a TV and that's fine. Maybe they're readers or they've got a little hobby that they do, but most of them do have TVs. Um, our maintenance people, most of them are mounted to the wall. So it's a little slimmer and they have a little more flexibility of maybe putting things on top of a dresser or, or things like that. So it's, it's really customizable to the elder. Um, before we go to some final thoughts, and maybe this is something um, Lee and Aileen, you can comment on. There were a couple of questions going back to the bathrooms and they were, they were about what, what's the right flooring to have in the bathroom? Um, how do you ensure that it's not gonna be slippery? Um, is there something that you suggest, especially if you've got a European shower, you're gonna have water over a large uh, surface area. So how do architects attack that or address that? So there's a, you know, from a technical perspective, there is uh, different flooring materials have a slip resistance rating. Um, but in terms of selecting materials, mosaic tiles have a higher slip resistance um, just because the nature of that product uh, more so than larger format tiles or, or sheet or sheet product. All right, well, we, we can take a few more questions unless you wanna go on to final thoughts and see how much time we have left there. Well, we, let's do final thoughts and then we'll come back to any questions if we have okay. more time. Great. Um, it, it occurred to me that we didn't really touch too much on COVID. Um, and maybe we skipped a little over a couple of our talking points, but I think the, the important message, uh, if, if you don't know, is that the greenhouse had tremendous success over the last 15 months. Um, and I think maybe the best way to describe it is just to turn it over to Heather and, and Jessica and, and let them share kind of what their success, success story is and what changes they did or didn't have to do as a result of, of dealing with COVID. So Willow Ridge is a community with 20 elders um, and affected by COVID. We, we've actually to date only had two elders um, that ended up with COVID. We've had a handful of staff. Um, but we fared pretty well during all of it. Um, our elders, you know, families missed them, but I think, and I think the elders missed the families, but they, they really did very well. Um, we did a lot of FaceTiming and Skyping and video window visits, that kind of thing when COVID was really um, bad. But um, overall, we actually didn't have to add anything to the houses. Um, you may see a few more hand sanitizer bottles sitting around. But other than that, we, we never had to install anything. Um, the design actually worked really well for what we needed to do because of COVID. Yeah, the, the, the model is really set up for it. Um, you know, from the, the small scale to the private rooms and, and to your credit, Heather and Jessica and all your peers, it really what we learned from a lot of our interviews is that the staff really took ownership and responsibility for the care and health of their elders and they changed their own personal lives to make sure that those elders were safe. Um, okay, some, just some final thoughts. So today we talked about the resident room and how they contribute to dignity and privacy and choice. And between today and two weeks ago, we talked about the, you know, the different spaces, the shared spaces within the, within the house. We talked about the, the relationship between the architecture and the operations and how there's a really close integration between those two. Um, and when that happens, the house becomes home, which is really the beauty of, of the, the three core values of real home, empowered staff and meaningful life. And, and, uh, and through all three webinars, I hope that you've also seen the opportunity that the, the greenhouse is not one size fits all, um, but well, maybe size, yes. <laughs> but the configuration and the idea that there is a tremendous opportunity for the personality, the culture, the region uh, to really have an influence on the design of the greenhouse uh, and really to make a greenhouse, the greenhouse that's appropriate for that organization. Uh, and with those final thoughts, Debbie, I'll turn it back over to you for final questions. Right. So Heather, there was a question about medications. Um, what do you do when you have refrigerated medications? Where are they kept? Because we didn't see a refrigerator next to the medication cabinet inside the room. That is correct. So we have um, a very small 
uh, we call it the nurse's closet um, in each house that's locked. And so what we keep in there would be extra dressing supplies. There is a small refrigerator in there. Um, there's also our narcotics are in there because um, in our state, I don't know about others, but in our state, they have to be double locked. So they're locked behind a cabinet, but they're also locked behind a locked um, room too. So yeah, so there's a small fridge in each house for medications. And then actually in our dirty laundry area on the counter, there is a small refrigerator for lab specimens because we did find that we needed some place to keep those um, when the lab comes to pick them up. Okay, and I think this is a great question to, to end with. And I, I will say to our audience, thank you for all your questions. We are going to be pulling all of our questions together from series one, series two, and series three, and creating kind of a final document that we will share with anybody that's attended thus far. So if your question didn't get answered today, you still have a few minutes to write one in, and we will get back to you. But Heather and Jessica, how do you go about facilitating affectionate relationships when everybody is in? their own separate private room. How do you do that at the greenhouse? I mean, for us, it's the convivian at the, at the meals. It, I mean, just like anyone else's home, food brings people together. <laughs> uh, my house, people gather in the kitchen. Here, they gather in the hearth, which feeds into our dining area. And, you know, they're, they're happy to see each other. They, they're, we're lucky that they truly all enjoy each other. And, they, you know, it's just a, a time that they get to spend together and, you know, get to know each other. Some of our elders are from the local area. Some of them have maybe moved from out of state because this is closer for other family. So they're new to them and they really, they build strong bonds and strong relationships. And it's from a Shabazz standpoint, it's, it's really nice to see. I mean, they become our family and they become each other's family. Mm -hmm. Beautiful answer. Anything you want to add, Heather? Um, just, I was just going to share from today. We had a lady walking out to the dining room table and she was, come on, Dorothy, come on. She was saying that to her neighbor. <laughs> and then she reached over to one of the Shabazz at one time and said, can you check on her? I don't think she's acting quite right. So, you know, the elders check on each other and they truly yeah. are a family. Well, those are some beautiful stories. So I'm going to ask Susan if she'll rejoin us for some final thoughts. And I just want to say thank you to all of you today. Um, Lee, uh, Aileen, Heather, Jessica, you've had some great stories and you're doing a fantastic job in um, just creating great lives for our elders. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I'll just add my two cents. This has been just phenomenal. And I I don't know if we've ever had so many questions, like 42 questions in the Q&A box. That's probably a record. And I, I just have to do a shout out for the piano in the room. I thought that was just phenomenal. Um, talk about deep knowing. And when you said that this, in the previous uh, facility, they didn't even know she played the piano. Uh -huh. You made a way to get a piano in her room. And Aileen, I'm with you. I thought that can't be somebody's room. But uh, when I heard that it was, I mean, it, it just goes to tell you the impact of all those core values coming together and that really that push for deep knowing and then creating those physical spaces to make it work. And obviously the staff empowerment that I've seen exhibited just between you, Heather and Jessica has been incredible today. So thank you. Um, thank you once again, Perkins Eastman, for your sponsorship, for your partnership, for the opportunity to dream with you. I, I think Lee and Aileen, it feels like you've been to Greenhouse School. <laughs> and, uh, you, uh, you know us well, and it's been a wonderful partnership, and this has been a great series. So uh, with that, Debbie did mention that there will be a, a final FAQ sheet that will come out that will incorporate all the questions, including those that did not get answered today. Um, so stay tuned for that. We will compile those, make sure you've got the answers to that. Thank you for registering. Um, and Janet, if you want to kind of show us uh, some slides, we'll kind of end on those things that are up and coming. You know, as a nurse, I can tell you that uh, Nurses Week is up and coming. And to honor nurses, we have a really cool uh, webinar that's being sponsored by Select Rehab 
from trauma to tranquility, say that 10 times, um, but think about how important it is for such a time as this, for us to really honor nurses in a way that really acknowledges the heroic efforts that uh, nurses have been engaged in over the past uh, 15 months, especially. Uh, May 11th at 3 p.m. Eastern will be that uh, webinar for us to honor nurses. Canadian workshop, and I have seen a few of my Canadian friends on today's webinar. And just to let you know, we've heard you, there has been incredible Canadian interest in the work of the Greenhouse Project. And so we are doing a virtual workshop. Um, we will be, we call it our Vancouver workshop, but only because we've been conferring with friends in Vancouver, but it, we are really wanting to acknowledge your interest. June 10, 10 a.m. to 3.30 p.m. We really want, and that is specific time, just so everybody knows. We really wanna make sure that we hear you, we see you, and we want to really begin thinking about how does the greenhouse model inform what's happening in Canada. On the next slide, this is something I'm especially excited about, and there will be many, many more details uh, coming. Dementiaverse, we are kind of heading into a whole new frontier in learning collaboration and scholarship. Three of my really good friends, Dr. Jennifer Carson, Dr. Emmy Kyoto, and Dr. Al Power, they are headliners and stay tuned. There's more and we will be announcing those shortly and be offering our registration link on our website. You will definitely not want to miss Dementia First and that will happen September 14, 2021. On the next slide. Elevate elder care. I, this is one of the most fascinating things I do in my day job. Um, tomorrow, we have an episode with Dr. Michael Wasserman. He is a geriatrician, and he will be on tomorrow's episode. If you missed the last one, you will hear Steve Nash, one of the most amazing providers in Washington, D.C., and he will share his story and his experiences. Every Friday, my colleagues, Mary and Marla, they do. Let me say this about that, which is kind of a recap. So if you just need the shortened abridged version and here are the highlights from the week's episode. You can go there. Um, and I think that's it for today. Again, thank you, Perkins Eastman, for your sponsorship, for your partnership. Thank you, Heather and Jessica, for all you're doing every day. We live vicariously through you, and we honor the incredible work that you do each day. So, Debbie, as always, thank you. And Janet, the wizard behind the curtain, thanks for your support. And um, we'll do this again. Take care, everyone. We'll see you soon.